In early March, two American banks imploded in spectacular fashion. They collapsed faster than a paper-handed wannabe day trader. Their sudden demise threatened to send shockwaves throughout the greater financial system and American economy. But the U.S. government stepped in to prevent that from happening. Since then, I've seen a lot of claims and, frankly, misinformation floating around out there, especially around the dreaded B word. Yep, bailouts. I've found that a lot of this information is being floated by people that, frankly, don't really know what they're talking about. You know the ones. Those who have economics degrees from Twitter University. I wanted to look at these claims to see which ones were flat out wrong and which ones uh, might actually be backed by some evidence. Now I know what you're thinking, but Griffin, why should we take your word for it? This is your first video on YouTube. And that's a fair point. I do have a degree in economics, but you don't have to take my word for it. In the description below, I'll leave sources for all the findings I make throughout the video. Okay, let's take a quick review on how we got into this current banking crisis. For the sake of this review, we're just going to focus on Silicon Valley Bank. Now, Silicon Valley Bank was a banker to primarily companies, mainly tech companies. So what this means is that they hold a lot of deposits that are above the FDIC's upper insurance limit of $250,000. Now, we'll get back to that in a moment. But the main problem here, or their main vulnerability, was that 94% of their deposits were uninsured. That is the second highest ratio among U.S. banks. Now, going back in time a little bit, SVB's deposit growth has been pretty large since 2020. Uh, the, the tech boom kind of during the COVID years, a lot of their depositors were raising money from venture capitalists and other investors. This created large deposit growth in Silicon Valley Bank, uh, going from $65 billion in 2019 to $189 billion at the end of 2021. As SVB took in these new deposits, they invested them in sort of long-term fixed income securities, primarily U.S. government bonds and mortgage-backed securities that are issued by U.S. government agencies. Now, prevailing interest rates during the COVID period on these assets were very low. SVB took a lot of these deposits and essentially locked them away in these long-term hold-to-maturity securities and essentially exposed themselves to something that we call duration risk. Duration is a measure of the sensitivity of the price of the asset to changes in interest rates. So essentially, the longer to maturity, the more exposure you have to possible changes in interest rates into the future. Duration risk is sort of like sun exposure. The longer you are out there, the more likely you are to get burned. Now, SVB held over 94% of their deposits into these hold to maturity securities and loans, which is an absolutely insane amount and created a huge vulnerability for them. Fast forward to the end of 2021, when the tech boom started to kind of collapse on itself. And that meant that many of SVB's clients were starting to draw down their deposits uh, into 2022. Now, because they held so much of their deposits into these longer term securities, that meant that they didn't really have a lot of wiggle room should these deposit outflows increase. Uh, and that meant that once they spent their cash reserves and short term assets, they had to start selling off their longer term assets to cover the outflow. As the tech boom came to an end, Inflation was also running rampant in the U.S. economy, and that meant that the Federal Reserve started to fight back against it, and they would raise interest rates to tame that inflation. Now, they rose rates rapidly from a quarter of a percent in March 2022 all the way up to 4.75% in February of 2023. This very rapid increase in interest rates meant that the low interest 
long-term securities that Silicon Valley Bank was holding uh, dropped in value. They became susceptible to that duration risk. These vulnerabilities created sort of a perfect storm. The depositors and investors in Silicon Valley Bank became aware of them. The stock price started to drop as investors sold off their stock in SVB, and that spooked depositors, which started to withdraw their money, and SVB had to take massive losses as they had to sell off these longer-term securities to cover those withdrawals, which sort of created a spiral as investors uh, sold more stock off and that spooked more depositors and eventually they ran out of capital and failed. Once the banks failed, the US government stepped in to try to stabilize the situation and that's where our first fallacy that I've seen on the line has come uh, to light, which is that the US uh, government is bailing out Silicon Valley Bank. This statement is flat out false. The bank is not being bailed out. Uh, the bank management is fired now that the FDIC has taken over it um, and the investors have lost all their money. Even Joe Biden uh, made a statement about it. Uh, you can see the quotes on the screen there. In this day and age, some people don't always trust what the US president says. The truth is you can look at the stock price graph here. You can see that the trading has halted. The FDIC is looking for a buyer of the bank. So they were not bailed out and it is no more. However, the government did decide to insure all deposits at the failed banks, not just $250,000, which was the insurance limit. Now, remember that SVB had over 90% of their deposits were uninsured. So if the government just let that bank collapse, a lot of those companies would lose their money and that would create greater economic problems as those companies wouldn't be able to make payroll. People on Main Street would essentially lose their jobs because those companies did not have the cash to pay them anymore. This extended coverage by the US government is where the second incorrect statement comes from, which is that the American taxpayers are paying for the depositors bailout. We are not paying for the company's bailout, but we're paying for the depositors instead. This statement is also false. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation runs something called the Deposit Insurance Fund, which is essentially a fund that banks pay into that covers that $25,000 insurance for all depositors. Now, in the case that the bank is not sold off by the FDIC, they will use money from that fund to make whole the depositors who would have lost money otherwise. The biggest problem with this is that there is effectively no insurance cap limit if the US government is always going to make everyone whole. You don't have to worry about how much money you actually have in the bank. There's no real risk for you. They might want to look into making different insurance caps for individuals as opposed to commercial depositors and charging different rates for that because I think the biggest problem here is that the fees to cover these insurance amounts is ultimately going to be passed on to the consumer by the bank in the form of more fees or higher fees, which is fantastic. I'm sure that's exactly what everybody wants is more fees from their bank. The last incorrect statement I've seen floating around is that the Fed is bailing out other banks due to the destabilizing events created by SVB. This depends on your definition of bailout. You see, the Federal Reserve, as a part of their mandate, is to actually lend to banks to cover the short-term deficits and or other you know, liquidity problems that they run into. So if you think that that is a bailout, then yes, they definitely are bailing people out. To me personally, when I think of bailout, I think of 2008 when the Troubled Asset Relief Program 
went into effect. But that was a law enacted by Congress, not the Federal Reserve. And that was definitely a bailout. This personally is just a standard course of business, especially in harder economic times. Now, there's a graph that's floating around that's causing some alarm for some people. It shows that uh, in the week after the failure of SVB, there was a record borrowing numbers of $153 billion from the Federal Reserve by other banks. The good news is that these loans were made on primary credit terms instead of secondary credit terms. Secondary is the loans that are more of an emergency nature. Uh, they have more oversight from the Fed. They are essentially loans to troubled banks to keep the lights on. The bad news is the record amounts of borrowing indicates that there is probably a significant amount of strain on the financial system at the moment. This strain means that banks are probably going to be more resistant to lend money, um, scrutinizing the credit worthiness of borrowers, which means there's going to be fewer mortgages and less money flowing to businesses, which could slow down the global economy. Some people will argue that the Federal Reserve is lying or they are you know, saying these loans are made on primary credit and that the system looks okay when in reality it's doom and gloom. To me, that's just pure speculation with no supporting evidence, perhaps some justifiable frustration with U.S. capitalism, but it does kind of feel like a tinfoil hat prediction. If you don't want to believe the data, then so be it, but we don't have data to contradict it otherwise, so I'm inclined to look at what we have and base the decisions off of that for now shouldn't be closely watching the situation and when things start to change adjust according to that new information of course we should learn and adapt